Okay. We speak of the viewer opinion and music and how it changes our neural pathways and how we can choose to, to think positively. I'm just wondering how the Gestalt Health Method and our therapy applies to some of these. And uh, specifically in, in, the, in the, the, the population of people who have dementia. All creative, in research and in all creative expressions, music, singing, art, everything contributes to opening consciousness and that, what I've been calling the divine creative intelligence, our access to it. So all of these things are excellent. Uh, again, we've been, since we were in caves, we were painting on walls, we were singing and chanting together. So it's deep in our DNA to be doing this. So just as before we get to a couple of questions, I just feel like we promised, I've been promising all morning that we're going to talk about something. So would you like us to talk a little bit for a few minutes about what does the future, the possible future yes. uh, look yes. like? Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to toss out a few things for us to bounce back a little tennis game if we can. Um, is, you know, going back to much earlier conversations uh, that we have had through the years, is, you know, the religious use of our particular sacrament is very defined. So there's that. That particular plant, those plants in their natural state, the way they have worked for all of these years, will not lend themselves to a kind of laboratory work. There are other substances such as some of the research you've been showing, that will lend themselves more easily, A, to the kind of research that, uh, the kind of therapeutic use that you've been giving uh, kind of, um, information and exactly on. But there's this other thing that's happening, um, th that's happening in society where there's a big interest in the therapeutic use. What do we think that's going to look like? And what kind of training are people going to need? What kind of certification? Um, what does Health Canada do think about this? Because it's, you know, once we start using substances that are scheduled on the list, then you know, Health Canada and the Office of Control Substances belong. So that's what I want to open up. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have to hold this like this. <laughs> I think there were some responses already. No, no, no. That was my interest. That was my question. Well, you know, that's a, as far as the future is concerned. Uh, I don't know what the substance is. It, it all depends, I think, on whether they're going to be used properly or whether, you know, we slip back into into the problems in the 1960s. Um, I, I don't have any quick answers to, to that question. I have a lot of, lots of thoughts. You know, I, I feel that uh, you know the way I have is you really have, it really has to start with yourself. And if we, can, we talked about some of the things that, that need to be done. I think one one has to if one wants to use. Um, non ordinary states of consciousness, one has to start with self-exploration, and that could be in a physiological way or using psychedelics. And you do that You have to listen to yourself inside, what is, what is the right way for you, and at which, which point. And, and if you decide for psychedelics, then it's important to, to give the right guidance and, and the right support. That, that, that is very clear. Um, it's very important to keep the psychedelics in the society in use. There are several things. I think we're going to need to continue with the research. We're going to need to continue to give it a, a validity, social, social validity. We have a greater problem is how we're going to advance the research into non ordinary states of consciousness. Because we don't have yet a valid methodology. Mm -hmm. you know, trying to prove things that are already proven, uh, whether it's intuition or telepathy, by some um, reductionistic materialistic, it doesn't doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't doesn't move things ahead. We know that there are 
some qualitatively different phenomena in, 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 those, in those areas. Um, so uh, that's one thing. Proper proper use in the in the therapeutic menu uh, is going to be very important. So um, to move things ahead, I'm thinking about physicists when they talk about kind of gentle modification. There is a number of steps that I think need to be done. I don't think there's a single single solution. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have got one of the obvious things is to have programs like you're setting up here. You know, an academic program that's focusing on on non-ordinary states of consciousness and psychedelics. That's one of the important steps in the gentle modification. Mm -hmm. So yes. For me, the first step will be education. And where do we start educating? At what point do we start educating? Is it in kindergarten? Is it in grade school? Is it in high school? Is it in CSHEP? Is it in university? Are they elective courses that anyone can take? Is it part of an existing program? Does it come under religion? Does it come under medicine? Where do these things fit in? So I think that the education process um, of educating and it's re-educating about normal ordinary states. Some part of us knows as soon as we hear it, we go, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. As soon as we hear talk about consciousness and non-ordinary states, there's a part of us that recognizes that this is real and it's part of our human heritage. So education and where it begins and educating the general public about how it can fit back into our culture in one way and what place it, it has. Is it for spiritual and development or soul evolution? Is it for transformation that will help to transform culture and society into a more peaceful society, into a more caring society, a society that cares more about nature and, and about community? Because those are the results when they do large studies, for example, in, in Brazil with the Unio de Vistal mm -hmm. and with the Santo Daime, they find that those communities, there's less violence, there's more uh, community work, there's more charity work, there's uh, people have a better mood, et cetera, et cetera. How do we translate that? What does that look like? And then the second thing is, how do we educate the people who are actually going to work with? Um, you know, we understand how to, how to educate surgeons who are going to take out your appendix. We got that down really nicely. How do we, what does the education process look like for people who are going to be responsible for uh, working with psychedelics in a therapeutic situation? What does that look like? You know, surgery, we already know, the nurses, the instruments, the sterile environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the training of the physician, the specialists who need to be there for other, et cetera. But some of us have a, have a pretty good idea based on our experiences as to what works and what doesn't work. Now, how does that translate into some kind of training or certification program? Well, I think that one of the important ways to, to move ahead would be to actually educate ourselves about our non states of consciousness. Because the major, I'm, I'm sure that all of you felt some disbelief in, when you heard some of the things that, that were mentioned. And this is a natural, natural reaction. So I, I think that part of the education would be educate ourselves about our non ordinary states of consciousness. We all are deeply intuitive people. We don't use our intuition because we've been told that it doesn't exist. We all can act as, as, as mediums. The reason I know that, I, I should say, back when we were studying the electrophysiology uh, of, of uh, um, depression and mania, I, I uh, got involved with Elmer Green. And, and, and uh, I thought that, because we found out that depression and mania is associated with high uh, proportion of fast waves, data and, and the media. I thought we could teach people to, to change that. And 
because I'm going to be in development of the feedback side of him and to work with him. And it turned out that he, he was interested in um, finding out how we can influence some of the bodily states like blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and so on by, by feeding the information back to the subject. And so he collected people who were excellent in it, some people who trained 25 years in some ashram in, in Himalayas and they could stop their heart, they could change their blood pressure and so on. But working with pe those people, it turned out that these people are also amazingly intuitive. And so based on working with them, I, uh, I, I, I learned that intuition is a natural ability. That's one of the non-ordinary states where you can, you can enter into an invisible world. Mediation, you can, you, these are trainable things that, that, that you can learn. Watching your dreams when you enter, start bordering on another state, where things start happening, where if you watch it, sooner or later you will have dreams about, about your future, about some events from the future. And you realize that there is more to reality than, than you can talk. And, and I think that may be the first book, in a way. Convincing ourselves by our education that, that there is much more to reality and that there are no other states that we can access right here at any time. One of the examples that I usually use is if you want to learn how to swim, um, you don't start in the deep end with somebody else who doesn't know how to swim. You start with a lifeguard, with somebody who's got their training, who knows water. You also don't try to learn how to swim with somebody who read a book about water. <laughs> okay? But a lot of the times, that's what we're offering in our society. Somebody read a whole lot of books about something, but actually never got in the water themselves. And so, you know, what I'm picking up from in our sharing here is the process of awareness which is what the Eastern traditions teach us, and which I've been referring to as consciousness, is where we all have to start. That's the ABC of it. We awaken our consciousness. We awaken our awareness. Then as we're developing our intuition, that helps us make wise choices about ourselves and about our lives. And, and whatever, whatever stream or field of career or influence that you're in, that you can bring that awakened consciousness into what you are doing there, which then awakens consciousness of the people around you. It's kind of like a contact high. If people don't use, mind me using a 60s slang expression, if you are expanded, you'll find that the people around you will kind of start to expand a little bit and meet you in that place of expansion. So getting back to, you mentioned medium and um, intuition and, and this is something that absolutely working with non-ordinary states people will find their intuition is awoken and we all have this and I think that our society uh, sort of gangs up on intuition and tries to uh, repress it or gives it no opportunity to develop in a way that leads to a, a healthier sense of that and we are all mediums now unfortunately um, uh, there's a little paper connected to our website that I wrote oh, quite a few years ago called An Open Door because people have some misunderstanding of what mediumship and being a medium is. The first thing you need to consider that you want to channel is yourself. And if you're not doing a very good job of that, that's where you start. Don't worry about channeling anything else or being a medium for anything else. Be a really good grounded self integrated into your and grounded into your everyday life um, and then you will have the absolute best possibility of being open to a game of divine creative intelligence and what your intuition is inspired by to follow and to start to manifest does that make sense i should probably mention one point uh, that's important to what i said what I learned from these amazingly intuitive people who could control so well the 
different functions of the body, was that we are bombarded all the time by, by a number of uh, impulses that, that give us information from, from, from the invisible world. The trick with intuition is actually learn to relax and learn to read these, these impulses. You, you're experiencing them right now, right here. You, you just, if you're not trained, you, you don't know how to read them. These people were spending, they were actually sleeping very little. And they were spending at night for years and years trying to understand the, what the different symbols when you start experiencing them in the body, in your gut, in your lungs, here. Yeah. So it's actually teaching to, to read yourself, but it seems to be a great issue with, with intuition. I wonder if in the spirit of time, yeah, in the spirit of time, I have two or three more questions, and then, so I see maybe we'll go up here. Thank you. I've been in a military position for about 30 years. I've seen soldiers that have Speak a little louder, please. Yes. I'm in a military position for about 30 years. And I've seen soldiers that have experienced the altered states of consciousness on the battlefield, not induced by any substances. And there's a great book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger that talks about this PTSD epidemic that is not just due to what they saw, but the fact that they came back to a society that's very me-oriented. Mm -hmm. And if Michael Pollan is right, and if I read his book correctly, and thank you for referencing that, part of what shut down this incredibly rich psychedelic research in the 70s was the fact that the American political leanings were shifting from me to we, mm -hmm. and that if the critical mass had been reaching 4 million, I guess, consuming LSD, then potentially the American political system could have completely shifted. If the only way we're going to access proper research and do it right the second time, I think, is to get our politicians involved, mm -hmm. maybe we should get some of these substances into the water to wipe <laughs> out. <laughs> Responsible use 
research and supporting the people who are either legitimately and authentically able to practice and the research that could lead to other possibilities opening and maybe being patient with that instead of just rushing to open something that's underground where if there's a problem might close more than just that simple operation. Does that make sense? Um, maybe we'll take two more questions. So on, on the basis of that, um, there's a lot that's underground. Um, one of my teachers who was in the States, uh, the police that actually came up to him and said, we know what you're doing, but you're totally safe. We've had no complaint ever. So, you know, just letting things go. So there's a lot of that underground, I'm sure the authorities know, and all of these sacredly held sessions are a lot better than the raids and knowing what's happening on the street, so maybe they're less concerned. My question is, how would we step from bringing the underground into the open? Like, what are the, what, what do you think is needed to do that? Anybody who wishes to license um, under regulations needs to have a very good proposal to put in an application to the Office of Controlled Substances. That is the route that gets taken. Um, since all of these substances that we've been naming today require some kind of regulatory um, uh, oversight, licensing, or permitting whether it's research or whether it's the religious use, it all has to go, right now it all has to go through that. And that is for, you know, in their view it's for health and safety reasons. Um, and I think if people are patient, um, I think, and, and if anybody who wishes to make an application should, um, there's an article that I wrote on the Shakruna website. Uh, if you go to that, I outline exactly what the points, the main points are that the government will be looking for, which is what are you doing, how are you doing it, who are you doing it with, what are you using, how are you trained or certified to do this. The same way when, um, med when physicians come from another country, their medical degree has to pass the post, let's say coming into Canada, but there's an equivalency in their training, so then they can put up their shingle as a doctor. So to have a license or a permit for research or for authentic religious use, let's say, there has to, that's the door you have to go through. There's no other agency that's going to grant that. Uh, educating in other departments could be extremely helpful, but in the end, those are the people who grant licenses and permits, and that's it. There's nobody else to go to. Thank you. And maybe one last question. Maybe over there. Uh, where do you get the training? I'm already a tech psychologist. I already work in the transfer, transpersonal realm and it's been a lifelong path. And I feel really we call to integrate this and get more knowledge, practical knowledge, be able to work with the psychedelics, uh, myself and clients. Where do I go? What do I do? An excellent question. Um, we don't really have answers for you. Perhaps someday there will be a psychedelic medicine, therapeutic, something spiritual, religious training that's available with a certification course. I have no idea. I only know how I trained. I trained in the transpersonal psychologies and then I, I trained and mentored in Santo Dani. And, uh, and that's specific. I don't work with any other plants or any other medicines and I don't work with any other substances. Um, but having worked that, I have no doubt that any person who's been in Holy Cook at Breathwork would be a great sitter, or for anyone who's gone through Stan Groff's training would be a great facilitator um, to go into a program to learn more about becoming a, a, a sitter, because now they have the maps of the non ordinary states, they have the experience themselves of having been in the non ordinary states, and exactly what Dr. Groff was saying is you actually, you have to have the experience 
to understand the experience, to support the experience. It cannot just be a theoretical thing. Ketamine is easier to start with because it's legal and available. And there is a training program actually by Mark and Susan uh, Conti in, in Hamilton. I think you can find them on, on uh, you can find the website. And they have regular trainings for therapists. They didn't have one substance. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. For their, for their excellent uh, information, sharing so much of your expertise, your wisdom, your, your, as you said, 100 years of experience combined in this space. It's been a wonderful, wonderful way to spend the morning, and I feel very, very inspired from your intervention. So thank you very much.